Yeah, I got you. Lucius okay. gestures to the uh, to the knocker and says, "Shall we?" Can... Yeah, yeah. Alex follows him right in. Uh, do you mind doing the? And I'll kind of look towards my boots and Scrappy. Be the wizard's mind prestidigitating us clean. Yeah, I'll, I'll cast it. So you guys are cramming into this entryway, casting prestidigitation over and over and over. And who's actually doing the knocking? I will. Uh... Gus or Lucius? Which one? Lucius. I mean, the knocker is big enough; you can both get a hand on it. And... I'll grab one side, you grab the other, and three, <laughs> two, one. Lucius, you bang the knocker, and you hear this resounding thud from throughout the inside of the house, as you do. And you're not expecting an immediate response because, I mean, you showed up in the middle of the night. And after a few moments, the door opens, and standing before you is a tall, slender man with a scowl on his pale face. His sleeves and his slacks are slightly too short and slightly too tight for his arms and legs. And he's got this inky black hair that looks pasted flat to his head with a really bad comb over kind of situation happening and he speaks when he opens his mouth to speak to you with this harsh drawl and almost an accusatory tone and his hands are folded behind his back after he opens the door and he has to kind of loom over you because of how tall he is and he says as he looks over the group of you cleaning your various boots and clothes and large metal badgers. <laughs> Gotta keep your badger clean. <laughs> he says, The evening meal has already been served, but Bicklebell House will accommodate you. And then he stands Thank to you. the side and bids you enter. This might be the unhappiest butler you've ever seen in your life. And you guys just visited what was the name of that mansion? <laughs> Gwilva House earlier this session. Lurch from Adam's Family kind of a vibe. When writing this character's description, I almost wrote just like Lurch from Adam's Family except not a Frankenstein. <laughs> we don't know that yet. <laughs> Secretly a flesh golden. The... The room behind him is very, very large. And in front of you, what is that? 20 or so feet away? Yeah. 25 maybe. You see a large hearth that's just just smoldering. Uh, every few moments, a spat of rainwater will come down through the hearth and hit the smolder and send a gout of steam. Let me make sure I get the room descriptions here correct so off to your left hand side here is what looks like a side entrance into the house here immediately to your left and right you see two more of these little orbs that are dangling from the ceiling uh, these ones though are not illuminated they're dim so they're instead of giving off this blue illumination they're just they're not completely dark, but it's like having a dull nightlight plugged in in a corner of a room. Mm -hmm. And these are encased in little glass lanterns with iron, uh, like an, a little iron clasp that can be opened so the thing can be maintained if need be. And as you guys are entering the room, the tall butler holds up his hand and makes a gesture and kind of turns up the light on the nearest orb, just enough to give you guys a good look at the entryway here. Uh, this is... Is this the correct version of this map? Hold, please. <laughs> this, is not, this is not the correct version. I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the map, I'm like, there's something very wrong here. It's the one with all the little S's with a line through it on it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So also, what... when you shaved off this side and told us about this door on this side, it doesn't quite reveal the door. You might have to like shave off just a little more than you think. Or we're switching maps, right? Might have to shave your head. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Ah, zing. What? All right, listen. What will it take to yeah. get McDole to shave his head today? What will we have to do? Every, every man has his price. Eighteen million dollars plus a lifetime supply of chicken and dumplings. I'm a lot cheaper than that. I was, I was gonna say I, like I'd do it for like five hundo. I mean, I've got the eighteen million, but not the dumplings. So I guess we're in well. Path. I guess you're sol then. Yeah. Sorry about this. The, I do have to I, upload the correct the, version of the map. I can get the I, chicken and dumplings, but they're not going to be great chicken and dumplings. There you but, go. Yeah, no, but you didn't. I, I, you I'm didn't. A man of, I'm a man of very high standards. My listen, chicken and dumplings must be to my satisfaction. You did not specify that. That's 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 changing that's, the goalposts. This is this is my fault. How? Did you guys ever wonder when you were a kid when people won like a year's supply of macaroni and cheese or whatever, what exactly that consists of? I assumed it was 365 boxes of mac and cheese. I assume. I mean, I, yeah, I don't. Like, I assumed, like, if you win a year's supply of, like, pizza, you just get one pizza a week for a year. Yeah, like, I always like assumed it was a bit of a ripoff. I could eat more than one pizza a week. I, I, I would, would, like I said, I've always kind of assumed it was a bit of a ripoff. Now, there is some yeah. lag when. I upload a new map to Imager to when it actually becomes available to me to use. Yeah, Imager, I was I'm doing some stuff with Imager yesterday and I was having some problems. I always thought it was 365 times 3 because there's three meals in a day theoretically. <laughs> wow. You guys I mean, really think these lawyer, free giveaways sure. are super generous, don't you? <laughs> I was just always curious. All right, now when I load no, in okay. this new map, it should keep There we go. All right. Now I'm in three. Now we've got numbers. So, looking into this entryway, this number three is actually a large billiards table. Oops. In the oh, center of the yes. that Alex is just standing on top of like a jerk. <laughs> Beyond that, uh, you see the hearth. And in front of the hearth uh, is a nice little table. Another one of these lighting orbs in the far corner various chairs and things and then there's an entryway off to your right hand side as well opening up into the dining area which i will reveal for you now four is the hearth yes four is the hearth three is the billiards table five is a dining room okay the dining room has a curio cabinet on both its north and south wall and just beyond the dining room is looks like a spiral staircase leading up to the second floor landing. Uh, the tall butler, who doesn't interrupt your cleaning and boot, unbooting rituals and things, but still seems very impatient nonetheless. Just he tells you he has the pleasure of being Mordecai, servant to House Bicklebell, and he would have your names. Lucius of House of Yuda. The Seeker uh, in the Dark. I will let you call me Florian. Alexander Flintraker. My name's Gus. Give him a little, sal like a little, like salute, quick. Finger. Well, no finger guns, sorry. <laughs> he tells you that the kitchen will remain cold until tomorrow morning. And that the rest of the guests have already retired for the night. Mm -hmm. Guests? But he will be fine. happy to show you to your rooms. Unfortunately... The manor does not have a room large enough to accommodate the five of you at once. How, how much is a, is a night here? He tells you there will be time to settle expenses in the morning. Who's standing closest to the door at this point? Uh, Florian. Florian, at this point, he gives Florian a curt nod, motioning to the door behind him. If you would, please. 
uh, uh, yeah, Florian obliges. And as he's closing, closing the door, he says, There are other guests in the house who have made their way to the manor today. He says you'll have the opportunity to meet them tomorrow at breakfast. Fascinating. And at this point, we're going to have to decide who is sleeping where. So let me <laughs> verify right. who's going where. This is where I have to correlate my notes quite a lot. <laughs> All right. Gus says, not it in the room with the badger. Oh, the badger remains outside. My apologies. I did. See, this is what happens when I try to <laughs> skim over my notes. Uh, no, the badger, he assures you, uh, can be put up in the kennels. But that pack animals and the like. And he says the term kind of questioningly in regards to Scrappy. But they are not allowed in the house. Oh, okay. Please Does he accept. give me, like, instructions where the stable is or anything like that? He directs you to the kennels out back behind the house. Uh, he tells okay. you to, if you... Well, he asks how well trained the creature is. Oh, I can just give him an order. So if, if there's kennels back there, he can go back there and find a space for himself for the night. And he says, very good, sir. Scrappy, go back to the kennels. Find yourself a place to rest. Try and stay out of the rain. And Scrappy, well, that's going to be impossible because it's raining pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be revealing a bit more of the map now. I'm going to give you guys the outside balcony, which you could have seen from outside. Sure. This upstairs hallway. This is actually 14 is like an overlook. 11 over here is actually a balcony. Okay. So, make sure that all the PCs are accounted for here, as far as my map is concerned. One, two, three, four, five. He tells you that with the arrival of five guests, he's saying this as you guys are following him up the spiral staircase, that mm -hmm. the house has more guests than beds ready to accommodate. But if one of you is willing and will accept his sincerest apologies, he would be more than happy to lay out a straw mat in one of the upstairs attic rooms for you. He assures uh. you that the attic is dry, warm, and safe, and you will be as comfortable there as in any room in Bickle Bell House. Are the other rooms uh, individual, or do they have multiple beds? Two of you are going to be sleeping together in the last remaining empty room. One of you is going to be in the single room in the attic. One of you is going to be in the makeshift room in the attic that he's going to have to put a straw mat down in. And the last of you is going to be sharing a room with one of the other guests. I mean, I'll take I'll take the makeshift room. That way my work doesn't keep anyone else up. Okay. I'll then, take make, them Hold on. Up, 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 up. Up, 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 up. Because both of you just took the same room. <laughs> oh. So I'm also going to give you on this map uh, 19, which is the third floor attic, the, the third stairwell, or the third floor landing. This would be the attic bedroom that is currently not in use, that one of you can occupy. The rooms beyond this are storerooms in the attic. This one here is where he's going to play as a straw mat. So Gus... I'll take, I'll take the room then, Gus, if you want the straw mat. I don't want the straw mat, but I'll take the straw mat. Okay, so That's Gus, not... you're taking room number 21, is that correct? Correct. Alex, you're taking 20, is that correct? Yep. Okay. I don't mind staying with... Uh... Another guest. Okay. Not. Then Lucius, you are shown to this room. My map refers to this as the breezy bedroom, 
because to get to it, you actually have to go out into the outside landing and come in from the outside. So rather than being connected to the house proper, it's almost like a <clears throat> like what would be like a screened in room. This is actually very common in Florida where like a house will have a screened in kind of outside room that gets converted to an inside room later in the house's mm -hmm. lifespan. That's kind of what's happened here. So it's a cozy little room, but it's a little louder than the rest of the house. Uh, because the walls to the outside are thinner and the doors go directly to the outside where the rain is just beating the hell out of it. So let me put Lucius in room number 12 here. Lucius, yep. you're instructed to be very quiet because the guest inside is sleeping. And all you can surmise coming into the room is a young man, a human man, sleeping in one of the bed. And next to the bed is a gargantuan trunk. That must be a real pain in the ass to travel with. And it's painted a wide variety of garish colors. And you can see where the paint is flecking off. And underneath is another layer of paint in all garish colors. And there's a big design on the front of it. And you spend a few moments in the darkness trying to figure out what the design could be. Before you realize it's just an empty space where a name could be painted over. Uh, like a showmanship kind of situation. But the man is splayed out on the bed. And he's kind of completely uh, cocooned in his covers. And he's tossing and turning pretty badly. But he is asleep. Uh, Lucius, before you go out, before we split up and go off to bed, I'm going to hand you one of the pair of sending stones I've made. Okay. <laughs> so that leaves Seeker... And the other guy. Whatever his name is. So to get to your bedroom, after... In, well, I guess Alex would be with... Or not Alex. Uh, Gus would be with you as well. Because he's going to get everyone else situated. He's going to take Gus upstairs and lay out, a lay out a mat for him. That's how this is going to work. I have lost my revealer. Ah, there. there it is. Nice. Thank you. Uh, on the second floor here, he takes you into this door. And he bids you be very quiet as you come in because guests are sleeping on this floor. This is a commons area on the second floor. Uh, so you have a couple... You have two curio cabinets in this room. The first one has what looks like soap carvings hundreds of them of all kinds of things humanoids demi-humans uh, men-at-arms knights wizards various kinds of monsters lots of different kinds of animals just hundreds of them very meticulously lined up in rows the southern curio cabinets contains uh, is more functional, more practical. Contains flatware, silverware, things that people in the room might need. He tells you that to get to your room, you're gonna have. He's gonna have to travel into. You're gonna have to travel through another one of the bedrooms. So he's gonna go in, uh, gently wake the occupant, so as not to disturb them too terribly much. Uh, because he tells you that the woman inside is convalescing from a recent injury. So he goes in first, into room 17. This room is called the orange bedroom. It's called that because every surface in the room is painted a bright, garish orange. The bed sheets and linens are orange. The table is painted orange. Uh, the light in the room is not currently on. Uh, but you imagine when it is, it will be orange. The floorboards are orange. The walls are papered over with orange. And after he has a brief conversation with the woman inside, he comes out and tells you that she wasn't asleep after all. And that there's no uh, worry that she'll be disturbed. If you would please follow me. And he takes Florian and Seeker into this room. This bedroom 
is called the Doll Collection Bedroom. (laughs) There is a large double bed in the corner of this room, and there are shelves along the uh, eastern and southern walls, and dozens and dozens of dolls are sitting here (laughs) staring at you. And he tells you, make yourselves at home. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> he says, all hell. I love it. You will be roused for breakfast service at seven o'clock. Please, yeah, we will. do not Question. disturb the dolls. I wouldn't dream of it. I was going to make myself burger. at home, though. Lucius, what's your question? Uh, I don't actually see a door a doorway out to the balcony from here. Like, is it covered up over here somewhere? Yes, you came through. Sorry about that. It's yes, you came through right. here. And room number 10 uh, is just an upstairs cleaning cupboard. So if you come through, it's a double, it's double doors leading outside. And then off to the right is, you just look into this small shelved area. It's just a cleaning cupboard. So Lucius is sleeping in here with a tossing and turning man. Seeker and Florian have been placed in doll hell. The good news is, once the, the, the curtains are drawn and the light is doused, you can no longer see the hundreds and hundreds of dolls. <laughs> that is good news. They can see you, though. <laughs> Always. I'm sure there is a truth behind all of those dolls. I'm not sure I want to know what it is. <laughs> Flory's like, well, I'm going to go to sleep and never wake up again. Thanks. <laughs> so, Alex, after a few moments getting yourself situated in this room, Mordecai comes back upstairs uh, with Gus in tow. And he stopped off at the little cleaning cabinet and has a bedroll of straw and a couple of feather pillows. And also in his arms, a... Uh, a spare blanket. And he's brought upstairs and he leads Gus through your room into what is a storeroom. And he spends a few moments dragging boxes across, maneuvering. It just looks like they've got pieces of unused furniture and things in here, all covered in white sheets. And he rolls the bedroll out in the corner for you, places the the uh, feather pillars down, and informs the two of you that breakfast will be served at 7 o'clock. And he trusts that you will sleep well. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And Thank you. He takes his leave of you. And Gus looks down at, at, at Alex and says, Boy, I'm glad there's not hundreds of dolls staring down at us as we try to sleep. <laughs> that would be weird. awful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a weird so, thing to bring up. <laughs> Alex begins setting up his field alchemy kit. Now, you guys... Uh, everybody except Lucius, as he brings you to your room... And gets you installed. He pulls out from inside of his ill-fitting jacket that's too small for his body. An enormous ring of keys. And takes one of the keys off the ring and hands it to you. So, Alex, you have the key to this room. Okay. Either Seeker or Florian has the key to this room. Who would like it? I'll take it. Okay. Uh, Lucius, you're not given a key to your room. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Gus, you're given a key to your room, but you're assured that usually uh, this is not used as a bedroom, but a storage area. So, unfortunately, and again, with my sincerest apologies, but he does ask that you do not disturb the other amenities of the room. You know, He basically wants to make sure you're not going to go rooting through things. More to the point, he doesn't want you going through this door further into the attic. I'll agree. Okay. Then he gets you all situated, and he disappears back down to the stairs. What is the status of everybody's doors? This is a question for everybody but... Lucius, because Lucius is not able to lock his doors. Uh, I mean, my opinion is we should probably 
You think we should lock the door? I mean, we're not adventurers. We'll be fine. <laughs> uh, Gus is going to walk over, take Alex's key, and lock this door. And okay. then he's going, he's, going, about it. <laughs> he's going to drag his pallet into the room with Alex and lock this door. <laughs> Okay. Right, don't don't knock that one over. It would probably cause us to both suffocate. <laughs> okay. Do Seeker and Florian lock themselves inside with the dolls? No. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Not. What? <laughs> Got some racing key to room twenty from my sheet. You should add it to yours. In okay. fact, is there a uh... <laughs> is, is there, there a an window? overhang on this on this overlook? Like, does, is the Overlook being rained on? Well, you can actually see the whole front of the house here. So, no, the Overlook oh, and no, the no, balcony great. level. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm going to be leaving my familiar out there tonight. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to go sleep out there. Seeker, <laughs> do you still have Detect Magic active? Yeah. None of the dolls are magic. <laughs> For now. <laughs> Everybody go take the benefits of a long rest. And let's take our break here and let's reconvene sure we at 5 o'clock. <laughs> take 15 minutes, get your coffee, get your bagel, and we'll go into what is, for me, the hard part of the adventure. I got a 12. Yeah. No dot, dot, dot. All right. There is no sunrise because the storm does not relent. If anything, the storm worsens over the night. But it's 7 o'clock. Or what you surmise to be 7 o'clock. It could be any time at all. You have no way of knowing. Any time o'clock. But you are each in turn uh, probably Seeker and Florian, depending on how strong of sleepers you guys are, you're probably roused when the girl servant comes upstairs to wake up the woman in this room uh, earliest. And she uh, raps on the door and tells you that breakfast is being served. Uh, a young human voice, a girl, demure, but probably late teens. Uh, do either of you open the door at this point? Yeah, I mean, Florian would. <laughs> okay. Let me check my notes here. Roll for initiative. You see where... I didn't get a good look at her last night because the room wasn't illuminated. But looking out into the orange room, uh, there's a gruff-looking Fearbolg woman laying in this bed. Her right leg is kind of suspended by this like makeshift uh, sling that's being suspended from the ceiling so her leg can rest up and out of the bed and you see she moves her leg with some difficulty as she's moving this wooden rolling tray into place next to her uh, so her breakfast can be set down so she can take breakfast up in her room the orange room is the orangest orange that has ever oranged it is bizarre uh, but you can detect a faint like earthy odor from this fear bulb. She seems uh, very rustic, very outdoorsy as she's here convalescing. I want to make sure there's nothing else that I missed from her. Explode. The only orange things in the room are some of her personal effects arranged on this table here, uh, where you see a short bow, a quiver filled with arrows, uh, a small stack of animal furs and a couple of animal traps laid out. And then at the far end, a pair of muddy boots, one of which is torn completely open from sole to heel. And there are some tools laying nearby. It looks like she's in the process of repairing it. Standing at the door is the young woman. She looks like she's 16 or 17 years old. And she smiles brightly as she looks in the room. She asks how the two of you slept. Saker kind of looks nervously over his shoulder at the dolls and says it was it was great. And she points up behind Seeker where there are shelves that you didn't even notice last night. Up between these two 
windows with more dolls. And she points to one in a blue dress with red tangled yarn for hair. And she points and says, that one is her favorite. And I say, does she have a name? Yeah, Lily Ann. That's a good name. We'll say that. Wait, the doll or the girl? The doll. Yeah, the doll's name is Lily Ann. The girl introduces herself as Nelly. Oh. Nelly, okay. She tells you it'll be her pleasure to serve you when you come down for breakfast. Mm-hmm. And at that, she gathers up her dress. And next, she pokes her head into room 12 here. Lucius, you probably woke up a few minutes earlier because the man in the room with you is groaning something fierce. Lucius would likely be re- being uh, would be packing a pipe steak on the uh, veranda before going downstairs for breakfast. So the young man's groaning wakes you up and you head upstairs onto the veranda to smoke a pipe? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in this case then, after you're out there puffing away for a few minutes, and it's kind of difficult to hear anything because the rain is just destroying the roof over your head. And even if with your back pressed up against this wall, like you, you kind of have to press yourself all the way back because the rain coming in at an angle is splashing against your feet. But you hear some voices inside as the girl comes in and exchanges words with the sleeping man. You can't make out what's being said because of the sound of the rain. Mm-hmm. And then after a moment, her head pokes out. She's smiling broadly at you. He tells you that breakfast will be served downstairs. Certainly, thank you. She offers you uh, the grat- gratitude of House Bickle Bell for acknowledging that there can be no smoking inside the guest rooms. Figured as much. I want to be impolite to my uh, roommate. And with that, you hear her disappear out of the room and back into the house. Alex and Gus, there is a light rapping on the door that awakes you in the morning. Yep. Mm -hmm. One of you would have to open the door because it's locked from the inside. I don't have a key anymore. (laughs) But you hear the voice on the outside telling you that breakfast will be served momentarily. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. And is everybody going down for breakfast? Is anybody doing anything else? Yep. Breakfast sounds good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Breakfast sounds fantastic. Getting out of this room, super good. <laughs> uh, Lucius. Yep. As you come back into the room, having finished your pipe, uh, you see a young man sitting there, and he's kind of rubbing his eyes. Uh, let me get you a physical description of this man. He's clumsy and awkward, and he has naturally poofy hair that you can see uh, is is light in color, and something is very strange about it. And kind of looking at it, you realize it's because you see that it's been dyed in colored stripes. So long ago now, the dye has almost completely worn off. But you can see where part of it was green, and part might have been blue, and part was orange. You haven't yet had the color orange ruined for you for the rest of your life, so you can still recognize it when you see it. <laughs> uh, you see he's fishing around in his giant trunk that he's got open, and he pulls out uh, some cloth shoes and pulls them over his feet. And when he sees you enter, he's taken aback for a moment. And you can tell that he's never seen a typhling before, or if he has, not recently. And he kind of... Oh, like bow. His name was that, good morning. I didn't know that I had a roommate. Lucius offers a hand. Lucius, you dog. And he trepidatiously takes your hand and shakes it. You can feel the sweat and clamminess on this boy's hand. Rough night. Because he gets... My name's Aylesbury. He says, no, I... I, I'm sorry, say it again? Aylesbury. Aylesbury? I I slept comfortably, thank you. And... What's your passive perception? 
Lucius is bad, his perception is in another town. Uh, 17. 17. That's pretty good. Yeah. You can tell that you caught him unawares. What's your passive insight? Nine. Nine. You can tell that you caught him unawares. Uh, and you can see that he's kind of scrambling to get his trunk closed and the clasp locked. But in the moments before that happens, you get a glimpse at some of the objects inside. Uh, just for a moment. But you see uh, stacks of what looks like lumps of cloth. And next to them, you see a glint of metal. Very, very shiny. Just before he gets the trunk closed. I won't press him on it. Okay. Nailsbury kind of makes a very awkward small talk with you for a moment. As he gets his shoes on. Pulls on his breeches. And everything in this room is kind of subtly damp. Because of its nature is uh, the, the breezy bedroom. How it's just connected to the outdoors here. But you also get the sense that this young man, even if he had slept in a different room in the house, would probably still be somewhat damp. And do you head down to breakfast with him? Yep. When you guys get downstairs, breakfast is being served in room number five here. The Fear Bulk woman doesn't take her breakfast. When you come down to the, to the room here, you can see where places have been set for each of you at this table. Uh, plus Aylesbury, plus a young dwarven couple who are already sitting there awaiting service. A man and a woman uh, wearing, wearing dwarven finery, very nice looking leather and sturdy cloth clothes. And where is their description in my notes? The man has bright orange hair and beard. And the beard and his hair are dyed with white spots, bleached in areas. Is anybody proficient with an herbalism kit? Nope. Or nature would also be appropriate. Uh, yeah, that's me. Alex, make a nature check. Fifteen. Fifteen. You recognize the pattern, the coloration of this particular shade of orange and these white spots is a kind of sumptuous mushroom that grows deep underground called an edel. Edel caps are used in particular kinds of, I mean, they're used for everything. Uh, brewing, food, alchemical supplies. Basically anything that you can do with a mushroom in Dwarf Fortress, that's an edel cap. Hmm. Sitting next to him is a young dwarven woman. And she has her uh, untamed black hair on her head that you can see that she made braided maybe two or three weeks ago and hasn't touched since. And all of you recognize the very faint smell from her, even though she's handsome, handsomely dressed and well-groomed, uh, except for her, her hair, which looks like it's the braid of it's coming undone in places. But because you all live on a barge with an artificer, you can smell the faint, odors not unpleasant but of just acrid tools and solvents acids a workshop this is somebody who spends a lot of time in a workshop the dwarves are already down here eating breakfast Aylesbury comes down with Lucius the girl Nelly takes a tray of food upstairs to the fear bowl Mordecai is also here during breakfast service but the woman doing most of the work is a short, pleasant, and pudgy woman. Her apron appears immaculate, even though she spent 
all morning baking and cooking. And she has a mass of gray hair on her head, pulled up in a tight bun. And she's scurrying around at light speed, getting all the places set, putting out all the food, filling up all the, 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 the mugs. She introduces herself as Mrs. Bobkins. And it is extremely clear that Mrs. Bobkins is the personification of a morning person. <laughs> uh, I'd say Lucius is a morning person, too. And they serve mashed oats and potato hash and a slab of ham and fine black coffee. coffee. Yeah. As you take your breakfast. Uh, Gus will introduce himself uh, in Dwarvish to the, the couple and ask them uh, how long they've been staying here at this establishment. And the Dwarven man uh, wipes his mouth on the back of his shirt and he replies to you in common. So, there's no need to be rude to the rest of the guests. He hands out his hand. He's, I speak common quite well. So I have the honor of being Abner Edelcap. And this is my dear lady wife, Jimna. And Jimna gives you a polite nod. What, uh, what area are you, you from? I haven't, uh, and I, I point at the beard, I haven't seen, that's, that's quite unique. And he launches into the proud family history of the, Ed you speak Dwarven, you should have been expecting this. Right. <laughs> into the proud family history of the Edelcaps. Uh... He's from one of the mountain homes. There's lots and lots of dwarven kingdoms nearby, and more and more as you go further and further to the east. Uh, and his family makes his fortune with this particular kind of cap. But he's the family's sixth son, and he left to find his fortune out in the wide world after marrying his beautiful bride. What's next? I mean, I, I'm just going to be listening to them while I'm eating stuffing, and I'm going to like try to subtly take food off the other's plates. Off of <laughs> whose plates? Uh, Seeker and Alex, because they're. I will ones. stab they you. They don't need it. They're too small. They're I too spent small. The night in the doll room. <laughs> and when Seeker you know mentions that Mrs. Bobkins nearby, who should be said is taking every opportunity to reload your plates with food as you seem to run out. There seems to be no end to it. And she says very pleasantly, completely sincerely, says, Oh, what a pleasure! It's my favorite room in the house. If only I could be a guest and sleep in it myself. And she slaps Seeker on the back and says, How fortuitous! Uh, you said Bobkins? Mrs. Bobkins. Mrs. Bobkins. Um... This is like a Brick Brickleby House or whatever. I I'm terrible with names. I apologize. Like this is like me. This Bick is the player, not the character. Like Bick getting this wrong. Bickle Bell. Bickle Bell House. Mm -hmm. Is there a Mister or Mrs. Bickle Bell? <coughs> Excuse me, dear. I'm so sorry. I did not mean to interrupt. I seem to have a <clears throat> a small case of something this morning. Please do continue. I'm happy to answer any questions. Is there a Mr. or Mrs. Bickle... Uh, the name? Bickle the Bell. Mordecai, Bickle Bell. standing nearby, answers the question. It says, Bicklebell is the name of the manor, but there has not been a man of that name for many generations. Do you require more coffee? And yeah, Alex has no problem with uh, Gus taking his food, but he absolutely has like three cups of coffee in, in exchange. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yes, please. The house, then... To whom does this manor belong to? And Mordecai explains that the last surviving Bickle Bell left the manor to his servants to do with as they would. And so Mordecai's family and the Bobkins family have turned the house into essentially a crossroads inn for travelers in the woods. They How have long a, has that been going on? 
a, pl- a, uh, the... a welcome service, but an unusual one. I don't know of any people who come in and out of these woods fairly often. Uh, to answer Florian's question, Mordecai and Mrs. Bobkins were both young children when this happened. So their parents took over and then passed on to their generation. And then to answer Lucius's question, Mordecai simply says, the popularity of Bicklebell Manor. And he motions to the full breakfast table and then kind of nods to the guest room upstairs, is apparent and not in question, surely. Surely not. As you're eating, you guys get a good look at the two curio cabinets in this room. This north cabinet here. More dolls. This is a weapons cabinet of fine elven steel. You see crossed in the back of it, kind of the the set piece of it, are two crossed fencing EPs. Splayed out on the bottom of the cabinet are three beautiful daggers. There's also two knives, four blackwood arrows, uh, one of which is split lengthwise down the middle. And then off to one side is what looks like an almost crude iron hand axe that looks incredibly out of place. The southern curio cabinet is filled with fine liquors. Gus is just eyeing the cabinet. Mordecai notices that Gus is staring at the cabinet. He says, There will be an extra fee for service service from the liquor cabinet. Just glaring at you. Uh huh. He goes, How much for, uh, and he'll hold up his coffee and like a, just a kind of like a shot in the coffee kind of motion. And he narrows his eyes and says, Liquor is not served during the breakfast meal. Lucius just glares at Gustavus. Okay. At which well, this has been a pleasure. And so we have. The dwarf says uh, to Gus, Don't worry about that. I brought a tanker to find Stout. I'm happy to share with anyone. And then Seeker is going to do what? Perks up. This this has been a fantastic, uh, fantastic night. Tell all my friends uh, back in town. But we are currently planning on heading out. So if you all have any directions to the tower in the woods we'd love to hear them and halfway through your sentence is interrupted by the loudest blast of thunder you think you've ever heard in your life hmm. and and Seeger just gets a suspicious look at his on his face as he looks up at the sky and then he's just you can hear him muttering under his breath to which mordecai replies Traveling during a storm of this proportion would be inadvisable. Oh, of course. Bicklebell House be. is happy to allow the current guests to stay in their rooms free of charge until the storm passes. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I wouldn't want to monopolize <gasps> the room. Oh, I'm so sorry. I seem to be feeling a bit woozy. And Alex, looking over, uh, Alex does what? Uh, Alex uh, fishes a flask out of his uh, bag of holding, uh, pours next to a couple of shots of coffee into it. All right, I gotta go check on my badger. Okay. What happened? Was that Miss Bobkins that sneezed? Yes. And as Alex is taking his leave, you guys notice that Mrs. Bobkins' face has turned very red and get very puffy, and she says that she's feeling a bit woozy. And then she looks, starts to fall over backwards. Passes Gus, out. Lucia. Gus is going to try and catch her. Gus and Lucius make a dexterity check opposed to see who catches her. <laughs> we just bump heads. You roll uh, so badly, s- I have to levitate her. It's a 7. That's a 16. Lucius is out of his seat. Nobleman that he is. Catches Mrs. Bobkins in his arms. And she is puffing up badly 
And Mordecai comes like, over. Kind of thing? Uh, make a medicine check. I'll let anybody do this. I'll allow one one person to roll this. I've got a plus. I've actually got a plus to that. Plus one. It beats mine. That's, okay. Anybody else got a? I have a plus one. That's all you guess. All right. That's a, medicine. That's, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. A, go ahead. That's an eight. An eight. Yeah. I rolled very poorly. Might be an allergic reaction, but it's hard to say. I mean, you've only known this woman for a few minutes. Alex, yeah. heading out into the storm, uh, <clears throat> you know where the kennels are because Mordecai had to direct you where to send yeah. Scrappy. But, I mean, even heading out into just, like, the veranda here is sopping with rain. It's just being battered all along the house. And you can feel the wind picking up considerably. Looking out, you can see the trees. Some of them are bending harshly in one direction. You follow the stone path back around the left side of the house. Off to your left, you see the the, uh, the well house. And in the distance, on your right-hand side, is the, small, is the small structure, which is the kennels. And over to the left, at the far corner of the wooden fence, is a smaller fenced-in area where you see a small cemetery. Mm-hmm. Uh, the kennels look like they're in a good state. You see okay. light in that direction. And as you approach, uh, there is a young boy. And you, Scrappy is curled up in one of the cages. It's been left open. There was nobody there last night to close him in. But the boy is just standing there, wide-eyed, staring at Scrappy with this big, stupid grin on his face, kind of bouncing up and down. And I'll... Uh, I'll... Get Scrappy onto his feet, start taking his pack saddles off and hanging them in the uh, back of the kennel if there's space for it. And when you start doing this, he cries out, Mister, is this yours? Yeah, this is my friend. His name's Scrappy. Scrappy? What an excellent name! This is the best thing I've ever seen! What does it eat? How does it eat? Doesn't need to eat. It's amazing! Do you brush it down? Uh, yeah, sometimes with steel wool, like, there's a little bit of rust, I think, right now. Uh, maybe some corrosion from some... <laughs> I can't imagine that's acid, but it might be. He Boy, starts I gotta... pestering I I... you with questions about Scrappy. It's a slightly different type of wool. Maybe not steel. I wonder if we can get copper wool out here. Uh... When you ask if you need, perhaps, copper wool, he bounds off in the direction of the house. Are there any other animals in the kennel? Yes, there are several large dogs. It looks like he's in the process of feeding them and tending to them for the morning. Do any of them look like they're uh, tr- from travelers rather than from the owners of the manor? Probably not. Okay. It's not impossible, but probably not. But yeah, they're all busy eating their scraps for breakfast. And after a few moments, well, actually, back inside the house, because he'd have to pass through the dining room, this young, incredibly wet, muddy boy comes running in the house. What do you do with Mrs. Bobkins? Uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to... I... Lucius is holding her, so what does Lucius do? Uh, I, I can guide her toward uh, one of the chairs and... Actually, uh, Lucius will give up his chair. Okay. Let, have, let her sit down. What's Seeker doing? Okay, I'm going to... Um kind of step back a little bit from the table. Okay. And I'm going to summon my familiar behind my back. 